Well, good evening there. Thank you so much for joining us on Friday Briefing. My name is Betty Kell. As you can see, we're all set to wind up the week. So glad that you could join us on this 24th day of February 2017. I trust that you had a great day. If not, as you can see, let me even just stand here. We'll try and make it better in the next one and a half hours. So tonight, I'm sure you're wondering what is all this in studio. So tonight, my guest anchors are young women in business. I'm talking about women who've started from the bottom and now they're here. So they will be speaking to me. They are my guest anchors and we'll get to hear some of the most inspiring stories that you can get from women, the young women here in in the country. All right, so apart from that, of course, we have the comprehensive bulletin stories that have been making headlines throughout the day here in the country. And also, we have Willis the Word Master, who's going to be joining me from Kisumu County. So you better start uh, tweeting and texting me those uh, words that you want us to tackle tonight. So, without further ado, let's begin with the highlights. We all knew him well and I've worked with him closely for the people of Nyeri and the country. He meant well to try and improve the return on the coffee for the farmers. Nyeri Governor Nderitu Gashagwa takes his last bow as he succumbs to cancer. And it stalls negotiations yet again as a doctor's strike enters the 12th week. <laughs> Plus, gunshots and rising tension in Baringo and El Gil Marquet in the wake of the runway insecurity. Once you elect these people who keep on giving you all the time, when they go there, they don't empower you so that they can keep on making you poor so that you re-elect them all over and all over again. Voter bribery, <laughs> my dear brothers and sisters, is not going to go away. Also coming up, reports of rising cases of voter bribery right from the recent mass voter registration. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Our sign language interpreter is Marisha Uiti. Now, Nyeri County and indeed the the whole nation woke up today to news of the death of Governor Nderitu Gashagwa and the news has been followed by tributes to a man who now becomes the first governor to die in office. Carol Nderi begins our comprehensive coverage of the stories that made news this Friday with this report from Nyeri County. Governor James Nderi Togashagwa had died in a London hospital where he has been receiving treatment took residents of Nyeri by surprise. The governor has been in and out of hospitals for close to three years. Gashagwa died at the Royal Marsden Hospital in London, where he has been receiving treatment for pancreatic cancer. This is according to his family. At the family's Herega home in Matera, Nyeri, his brother Jack Gashagwa Deriani expressed shock and grief over his brother's death. I had this matter this morning. I was called by a younger brother, Regadi, around 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock there. And the children have still not come to to sit into terms with it. At the home, workers could be seen sprucing up the compound in anticipation of mourners that will visit. The security detail was also in check. The deputy governor, speaker of the assembly, and leader of majority offered their condolences to the family and the people of Nyeri at large. Tunamkubuka governor Gashagwa kama mwana siyasa chupafu sana ambaye hakuwa na ugopo ambaye alikuwa na nguvu sana a lot of energy ndio tulikuwa na tashwishi kidogo hapa na pale ya mvurutano ya maendeleo lakini hatukumtakia kifo hatukujua kama gavana agenda alikuwa mtu ambaye alikuwa na sura ya kazi alikuwa anajipa nguvu kila saa naweza tuko na uzuni sana mingi sana uh, mungu tu atusaidie iwe na roho hiyo alikuwa mtu wa vitendo sio watu wa kusema tu mtu wa kusema na kutenda tumesema pole kwa familia na tena kwa county ya yote ya Nyeri with the passing on of the governor given that this is the first situation of its kind in Kenya the deputy governor assumes power as there is no provision for a by election in the event of a governor's death look at this this is my appointment by the Kenya government that means 
Samuel Wamathai Gitaiga becomes the next governor of Nyeri up until when elections will be held later on in August. The late governor's younger brother, Rigadi Gashagwa, whom we spoke to by way of phone from London, said that the family had received messages of condolences from President Uhuru Kenyatta, amongst other key leaders. The family will now focus on bringing the late governor's body back to Kenya from London. The death of Governor James Nderito Gashagwa has caught many by surprise, particularly the residents of Nyeri County and also the leaders who have met at the Nyeri County Assembly to discuss this particular development. Constitutionally, when a governor passes on, it is his deputy who ascends to power. These are some of the issues that have been discussed in meetings so that they can streamline them, even as the people of Nyeri County express their sorrow at the passing on of the late Governor Derito Gashagwa. Carol Derry, KT News, at the Nyeri County Assembly. And following the Nyeri governor's death, leaders from across the political divide have expressed their shock at the loss as Marimi Mwangi now reports. Braving pancreatic cancer for close to two years, while at the same time fighting to survive in the abrasive and ruthless political landscape of Nyeri, was no simple task for Governor James Nderi Togashagwa, who passed away at 2.15 this morning in London. <laughs> and now, national leaders led by Nyeri legislators have expressed shock at news of Gashagwa's death. We resolve to work with the family in this trying time to give our departed governor a befitting send-off. I want specifically to give condolences to the family of Honorable Delito Kachagua and the people of Madela and the people of Nyeri. <laughs> For President Uhuru Kenyatta, who had late last year appointed Gashagwa to head his campaigns in Nyeri, the governor's death comes as a major loss to the country. While the Council of Governors, where Gashagwa once chaired the Agriculture Committee, described him as a firm believer of devolution. Opposition leaders Raila Odinga and Musalia Mudavadi described Gashagwa as a diligent leader who did not fear to stand by his decisions. Basenda Amayo is already with the family where they are in London and is involved in the process and making arrangements of how um, uh, the late governor's body is going to be brought home. <laughs> Gashagwa will be most remembered for his passionate fight to improve the earnings of Nyeri coffee farmers through a model dubbed the pool marketing strategy. The initiative would have seen Nyeri export all its coffee, fully processed and packaged, but the governor was frustrated by an alleged cartel of brokers. Kashagwa's arch-political nemesis of many years, former Madeira MP Ephraim Miner, challenged Nyeri leaders to maintain Gashagwa's momentum in the fight for coffee reforms. He courageously tried to make the returns from coffee at least be handsome to the ordinary man. And that is what should be pursued by every leader. On behalf of the... Uh... The Nyeri legislators said the national government and the Kenyan embassy in London will coordinate transportation of Gashagwa's body to Kenya. Nyeri Deputy Governor Samuel Wamadhai will assume the position of governor for the remainder of the term. Wamadhai, together with the county government, will work closely with the family to coordinate burial arrangements. Gashagwa has left a widow, Margaret Gashagwa, and four children. Murimi Mwangkechia News in Nairobi. Now the late governor Nderitsu Gashagwa is perhaps the epitome of the saying politics is a rough and dirty game whereby you must learn to roll with your punches and keep going if you are to survive. His political career was short and dramatic both as a member of parliament and governor. Here's Katian's Duncan Heimber with his profile. Uh -huh. 
At 64, the late Governor James Nderi Tugashawa goes down the annals of history as the first elected governor to die in office, hence paving way for the deputy to ascend to power without necessitating a by-election as per the constitution. Born on 29th July 1953, Gashagwe, a quantity surveyor by profession, plunged into politics in 2002 when he was elected member of parliament for Mathira constituency in the then larger central province, now Nyeri County. A term that saw him face fierce opposition from the onset to the end. In 2004, during Kenyatta Day celebrations, a section of Nyeri residents believed to have been supporters of his opponent disrupted the celebrations to stop him from delivering his speech as area member of parliament, a matter which angered the legislator. With the standoff persisting, a furious Gashagwa bravely confronted senior government officials on the ground for failing to restore order and enforce the law. We cannot have law and order. We are here for the OCS, we are the chairman of security, OCS is here. Do your work. Drama that followed him to the tail end of his term in parliament when he faced off with his political rival, engineer Ephraim Minor, during the 2007 PNU party primaries in Mathira constituency. A battle they both transferred to the capital Nairobi as they wrestled for the nomination certificate. I'm here at the PNU headquarters asking who is this person because I won the nomination, hotly contested, the people of Mathira have spoken and I want to know who could that person be. And I'm insisting this is a certificate that I must get. It's evident there will be no PNU candidate. Mm. Yes. I'm insisting I must get that certificate. And if not, I'm bringing the whole constituency here to find out why I will not be given the certificate after they have given their verdict. The late Gashagwa who tweeted the engineer who eventually defected from PNU to Safina party, taking their political fight down the wire. Facing off yet again at the ballot where Maina emerged victorious, sending a shower in the cold. In 2013, he made a comeback in politics, now big and powerful, when he was elected the first governor for Nyeri County on a little-known GNU party, trouncing his main challenger who had vied on the then-popular TNA party, whose presidential candidate was Uhuru Kenyatta. Just like in his first term in parliament, his tenure as governor was full of controversy after falling out with members of his county assembly. A bitter fallout whose climax was in 2016 when some of the MCAs opposed to his regime were accosted by his supporters in the outskirts of Nyeri town who whipped them thoroughly. <laughs> to return the favor, the leaders with support of local members of parliament jointly hushed and executed a dramatic impeachment process of the governor, which entailed having MCS sneaking and spending the night inside the assembly for fear of being kidnapped. Despite passing the impeachment motion to start the process of his removal from office, the Senate, through the committee of the whole house, overturned their verdict. Gashago had survived and was planning to defend his seat in the August 8th general election. But as fate would have it, he has taken his final bow, exiting the stage at 64 years. Duncan Hemba, KTN. Well, may his soul rest in peace. Talks between doctors and government have been adjourned until next week as parties yet again failed to reach a consensus just today after the Court of Appeal granted the mediators a further seven days to end the deadlock. And as Timothy Atena reports, it appears bad blood among those at the negotiating table may be compromising any progress made in the talks so far. Days and counting 
and it appears there's no probable end in sight for a stalemate that has dragged on for well over two months now. <laughs> Talks between union officials and government by Friday evening made no meaningful progress. After union officials were spotted walking out of the negotiations, a document in KTN News's possession dated the 24th of February highlights frustrations the union officials say have stalled the talks. The document explains instances where the principal secretary at the Ministry of Health, Dr. Nicholas Muraguri, who was tasked to lead the negotiations on behalf of government, failed to appear before the Committee for Negotiations instead choosing to send his junior Francis Musimi to lead the talks. The ability to progress the negotiations was seriously hampered on the 23rd of February 2017 by the absence of the cabinet secretary and the principal secretary of health states the document. The union has offered to move its position twice and has indicated willingness to continue presenting other scenarios within this mediation process, but these offers have been rejected by government, which would rather the strike continues than table an alternative offer, end quote. The government offered to have the basic pay of an intern medic stand at 44,089 shillings has been rejected by the doctors on several occasions. And even though both sides say much progress has been made in various aspects of the outstanding issues since the talks began two weeks ago, the bone of contention, some say, has always been the remuneration clause that still stands as an obstacle to ending the strike. In some counties, we have had doctors call for six months without salaries, and yet the national government has released money meant for salaries, but yet it is diverted to do other projects in the county. So if money meant for salaries could be uh, protected and given to counties as conditional grants so that it can serve the purpose it is intended for at that particular stage. The frustrations in the progress of the talks would be backed by a statement issued by the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights and the Law Society of Kenya today stating, quote, the mediation panel has adjourned the mediation process until next week and has informed the respective parties that if there is no change in their respective positions by close of business on Tuesday, 28th February 2017, the mediators will make an appropriate report to the Court of Appeal. The strike, now in its 12th week, has seen several attempts, both in and outside court, failed to resolve the stalemate that has left the country's healthcare system ailing for weeks now. Timothy Otieno, KTN News. Right, and that story uh, just brings us to our big question this evening and we'd like to hear your thoughts on it. We're asking you, having been uh, cited as an impediment to the negotiations, should the health CS and PS vacate office? That is a big question this evening. We'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I'm seeing quite a number of tweets coming through already, so let me just sample one or two here. All right, so we have Ivan... Ivan Lango, you say the two should have left a long time. It's a shame we're in this situation because of their differences. Kiroro R, you put it so simply, you say they should leave as soon as possible. Uh, somebody here by the name Jesse Carlvera, you say the CS has shown the highest level of incompetence. It would be fair for him to resign. So keep your comments coming. That is our Twitter uh, big question. We're asking you, uh, having been cited as an impediment to the negotiations to the health CS and PA, Yes, resign or vacate office. There you go on your screens. We'd like to hear what you have to say about it. Hashtag Friday Briefing is what to use, but you can also tw text us. The number is 22155, and I'll be taking a look at some of your responses here on the show.
right to some politics now. And Deputy President William Ruto today experienced firsthand the fears of the people in Baringo County over the runaway insecurity in the area. As he started to address the public meeting, gunshot sounds ripped the air as the people started to run away. And as our reporter Elvis Kuski is going to be telling us in a few minutes, the Deputy President did complete his speech and proceeded to visit the Carrillo Valley in Elgeo Marquette County. So we'll be having that uh, report shortly. But moving out now, six out of ten Kenyans who were polled in a voter bribery survey involving ten counties confirmed having received bribes from politicians and aspirants of elective positions. A report of the survey commissioned by the Center for Multi-Party Democracy and Conrad says although half of the respondents agreed that voter bribery is a crime, majority still took the bribes because no single politician has ever been convicted on the account of bribery. Well, Patrick Amimo has these interesting details. The survey on voter bribery as an election malpractice in Kenya was conducted over a period of three months between April and July 2016. A total of 514 participants responded to the questionnaire after they were engaged in an open debate and discussion on the issue of voter bribery. Residents in the counties of Bomet, Kakamega, Kiambu, Kilifi, Kisumu, Machakos, Meru, Migori, Nakuru and Transoya were targeted in the survey. According to the findings, Bomet County had the highest proportion of respondents who had ever received a bribe at 64.7%, while Migori County had the lowest proportion at 42%. 56% of respondents who participated in the survey confirmed having received a bribe from politicians, with the lowest amount being 50 shillings. When you divide 50 shillings for a year, run down per month, go into a day, it is 0 0.005 cents per day and somebody sits in that office for five years, it is high time that this is done and done right. Once you elect these people who keep on giving you all the time, when they go there, they don't empower you so that they can keep on making you poor so that you re-elect them all over and all over again. According to the survey, some of the methods politicians use to bribe voters include frequent harambes or fundraisers during the period preceding the elections and during campaign periods, payment of school fees, hospital bills and funeral expenses, making promises of rewards such as jobs and tenders. Other bribery tactics include making payments to persons who attend political meetings, giving handouts in small denominations, distribution of clothing such as t-shirts and lessos in the name of campaign materials, and paying for opinion polls, and influencing the process and results of opinion polls. Voter bribery, <laughs> my dear brothers and sisters, is not going to go away. Yeah. It is going to be there because you cannot go to preach democracy to a hungry stomach. We need leaders who can affirm the requirements of Chapter 6 of the Constitution. Electing people on account of the amount of bribes they give distorts the free will of the people, it distorts the outcome of the elections, it produces leaders who are not accountable, leaders who will not deliver. Respondents in the survey agreed voter bribery can be stopped if persons who engage in it are arrested and prosecuted. The giver of a bribe has committed an offense as well as the receiver. So we as citizens need to understand that this is not a problem of the politicians only. It's not them that have committed an offense, but also the receiving of a bribe constitutes an offense. Patrick Amimo, KTN News. All right, so we want to take a break here on Friday Briefing. Uh, but before that, let me just uh, remind you of our big question this evening. And we're asking you, having been cited as an impediment to the negotiations, should the health CS and PS uh, vacate office? That is our Twitter poll or our big question. We'd like to hear your thoughts on it. I'm seeing quite a number of emotive tweets coming in. All right, so D Dr. Khalid Aishek, you say, yes, let the CEO of the nation take responsibility of the Kenyan health care and do away with any stumbling blocks. All right, somebody here, also by the name, uh, Mohafanki Wawajir, 
He say how long the government remains numb on the dilapidated health crisis when soon uh, they should soon offer solutions. All right, thank you so much for your comments. Keep them coming and we'll continue to sample them as we go on uh, along here on the show. So I'm wondering why you, I know you're wondering why I'm standing next to, to, next to a mannequin or is it mannequin? We'll ask Willis the word master later. But it's because today my guest anchors, let me move closer to them. <laughs> my guest anchors, good evening ladies. Hello. You're looking really fly, so say hi to our viewers. Hello. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the three ladies on set tonight are my guest anchors, and they're here because they will be inspiring you with their stories of how they started their businesses. They're some of the most celebrated young entrepreneurs here in the country, and we'll be speaking to them shortly from this break. Don't go away, we'll be right back. And welcome back to Friday Briefing. Thank you so much for staying with us and joining us if you're joining us right now. Well, it's that, that time of the show that we get to uh, hear a bit more about our guest anchors before they get to go to the hot seat. So joining me tonight, like I mentioned, three ladies, and I'll start from here. This is Yvonne Kerry from Miss Kerry Fashions. Thank Hi you so babe. much for coming. Thank you. You look really me. lovely. Thank you. I can already tell that I want the dress. <laughs> Now we have Georgiana Washera, she's yes. from Plashik, and she's yes. going to be telling us what Plashik is all about. But also we have at the end there, Angie Livu, she's from Luxury Hair by Angie. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So tonight we're talking about young women in business. Mm -hmm. and the, but first, let's talk, hear a bit more about your companies. I'll start with you, Georgiana. Mm -hmm. So yours is at the far end, yes. the lady there, or is it here? Mm -hmm. So what, what, what is your business all about? Uh, Plushik store is a business about uh, intimate shapewear. We are specializing in uh, what we call the waist trainer, which is a shaping garment. Mm -hmm. And um, we primarily, actually, that is the core business. Um, this is a very popular trend in Kenya right now. Right. Yeah. So there are people at home wondering, what is a waist trainer? <laughs> okay, so a waist trainer is a heat and uh, sweating belt, and basically what that does is um, you wear it around your waist, mm -hmm. and this is both for men and women. Even men can wear it? Yes. Even yes. men with a pot belly? Men with a pot belly. <laughs> there you um, go, there is your answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> men who are um, just looking to get a little bit more toned in the waistline right. and what that does for you is that um, within about a month you can lose uh, up to three inches off your waistline but then it must be really really tight surprisingly not okay. it's actually very snug and what uh, that does is because it's made of latex it mm -hmm. does cause you to sweat a lot around uh, your waist region mm -hmm. and so we work with a lot of people um, in the health industry people who uh, are very conscious about their health okay. and people who are just looking to um, tone their bodies. All right. Yeah. Interesting. So we'll be getting to hear why you decided to go that direction. Mm -hmm. But Angie, also, you're into hair. And uh, who knew that hair could, you know, be serious business? How did you start? It actually started as a joke. I used to bring the hair for myself in school. Mm -hmm. So I'd bring hair and everybody's like, your hair is nice. I'm like, yeah, sure, I can, I can, I can bring it for you. Mm -hmm. So I used to bring it for free. Mm -hmm. Then at some point, I'm like, OK, no, I can make money for off free. this. For free? Yeah. All right. So yeah, you used so to bring it from, from where? Different Asian countries, mm -hmm. Peru, Cambodia, mm -hmm. some from uh, Brazil. And hair is expensive. I'm sure guys out there would <laughs> agree. You know, somebody asks you, you know, I want hair, but then, you know, it's in the thousands. Well, it's hair like it was grown from someone's head. It's mm -hmm. not going to be cheap. Mm -hmm. In countries like Cambodia, they grow them specifically to sell. So. That's why it's expensive. It's interesting because this, this conversation can go anywhere. Ladies, I'm sure you've had people saying, why should you wear somebody's hair? I think you should have your own hair. Why should somebody cut off somebody's, you know, their hair and then sell it to you? What do you say? What, what is your thinking about that? Why should you wear leather and it's not yours? I mean, <laughs> it's just... So it's the same way you wear leather. Yeah, it's, it's just cosmetic, makes you feel good mm -hmm. for protective styling sometimes. It boosts women's self-esteem. Mm -hmm. 
Men are happy when their women look good. Everybody's happy. So tell us, I'd like to hear from the guys who are watching. Does it make you feel good? Do you, you know, is it true, you know? Uh, let's come to uh, Yvonne. And your story is very interesting, you know. Uh, we spoke a few weeks back. And the way you started your business is really, really interesting. So you started business by selling SIM cards. Yeah. How crazy is yeah. that? <laughs> it's um, like SIM cards, like... Yeah. That was like maybe about um, five years ago. Um, I'm from Eldoret, so mm -hmm. I started my business by, um, after high school, I went to Airtel and they were selling, they're giving out SIM cards for sale. And it was like a recruitment sales and marketing position. <laughs> you know how they make a big advert in the papers. Yeah. And it I sounds joined so fancy. and I was excited. Yeah. And I think um, we went for the first training, you sell about 30 SIM cards a day. 30? And it was hard, you know, so but. It so was it the time that SIM cards, you know, the whole phone craze had just yeah, started? Yeah, like there was a huge competition between the phone networks. So, yeah. um, there were so many sales jobs for, you know, phone networks coming up. And I just finished high school and I wanted to make some pocket money because mm -hmm. my parents believed that, like, they were very, like, strict on, on your finances. Right. Like, you have to, you know, do your own thing. Mm -hmm. So I went for that and the pay per month was about 3,000 bob. A and month? And it was, that was 2006, I think. Uh -huh. So it was... Good money for them. So was, you know, I was like, yeah. that's, that's a lot. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't pay rent. I don't mm -hmm. buy my own food. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so that's how I started. And I think getting your first, you know, like your own money, it was yeah. quite Yeah, your feeling. first 3,000 You know, and you shillings. can do what you want with it. Right. So what I did with it is I took it to my dad. And because in our tradition, if you give your parents your first pay, that's what I was told. <laughs> that's what my parents told me. <laughs> <laughs> so... And when I you gave give them all, the first, yeah, your first paycheck, your first paycheck yeah. it's supposed to be good luck. So I gave my dad my first pay, which is 3,000 bob. Uh -huh. And he took it and he was happy and said, thank you very much. And then he walked away, then came back and gave it back. <laughs> yeah, so, so he gave it yeah, back. He gave, you are lucky. He just took 500. He gave me back okay. 2,500. And it all was right. quite nice. So all right. That was my starting, like, yeah. My so, starting so, so at what point did you decide you wanted to go into clothing? Because you have the, your online mm -hmm. store and you have your physical store. Yeah. And very many women, you know, mm -hmm. love to wear your, your dresses. I see that a lot mm -hmm. um, of advertisements about, you know, on your store online. Yeah. And mm -hmm. women really react to that. How did you get from selling SIM cards mm -hmm. to that? Um, again, when I was in school, when I, after, after my high school, I joined uni mm -hmm. to study law. So I'm oh, a lawyer. Wow. Okay. Um, so I was in Moyo University then, and I was, I needed to have like since I'd gotten used to um, the hassle, like you know, trying doing your own thing. <laughs> and I went to school, and I just felt like I needed to have some kind of something I'm doing on the side. Okay. And at that time, there was Eldoret show which was happening in Eldoret, and my mom had a big stall, and she told me, okay, I can give you a small part of it if you can do something. Mm. So I was excited, and I went to Nairobi. I got on a bus, came to Nairobi. I had she gave me five thousand bob on a loan mm -hmm. and said get the cheapest loan. yeah on a loan she was like I like I that I needed back after three it was, it was like on a Monday the show was on the weekend yeah like, uh, Friday to the Sunday she was like the next Monday I need 5,000 back and she said just go buy the cheapest jewelry you can get like for 20, 30 bob okay so I went and robbed and I looked around and looked and then I found somewhere I could get jewelry I know those places it was it was like yeah. there was so much stuff you know and I was, I was like a kid in a candy store right so, so I you bought so much stuff yeah uh -huh. and then I came back and it was terrible. I didn't sell at the show. It was, oh, you didn't sell anything? Yeah, only because when I went and bought jewelry, I got what I liked, which was like <laughs> fancy stuff. Yeah. I was in uni, you know, like feather earrings and gold coated. <laughs> so you when know, you stuff. bought it home, nobody wanted yeah. it. Yeah, so then I took right. it to school and it, All right. it so sold well. It sold well yeah. in school. Yeah. So, Jordana, for you, was it the same story that, you know, you were just trying out to get a few coins here and there or was it something that you always wanted to do and especially how did you get into like you know uh, what you're doing okay uh, maybe what I can start by saying is uh, this happened very organically um, I went to school uh, to architecture school mm -hmm. and in my last year what happened was my program was very hectic so I found it very difficult to um, be in a place where I was working out constantly and then I noticed because of the inactivity I started to look a little puffy underneath my dresses which is a problem a lot of women have. Oh yeah, Let's, yeah. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure most of us have felt like that. Yeah, yeah. so um, I did a little bit of research and I found out about shapewear and um, 
you know, we've heard a lot about uh, Spanx. We've Spanx, heard about yeah. the shipwear revolution even happening um, outside of our, not only our own country, but yes. even in the West. Mm -hmm. And so once I did the research, I was able to discover the waist trainers. And that was, um, I would say, late 2015. Mm -hmm. Uh, early 2016 okay and uh, once I discovered that I uh, brought in one and uh, my friends saw it and it became something whereby they're asking because this is an, a belt that I can actually change the way you mm, look mm. yeah so once I tried it on myself I loved it I felt that even within uh, about a month you can actually change the way you look completely underneath okay. clothes All right. so we've evolved from that as a business and now we specialize not only in the waist trainers but we do shapewear and we do all types of uh, very high quality shapewear mm -hmm. we also do um, intimates which is a uh, lingerie and um, underwear because there's also uh, something I discovered, uh, it's very difficult to find high quality underwear. So um, that's what now we focus on okay. as a business. All right, yeah. interesting. Angie, can you say the same thing for you? Like, you, you know, you, it grew organically, like it started from, uh, you know, somebody seeing what they liked and then it progressed on and became something serious that you do for a living right now. Yes, because I was very passionate about hair and there was a lack of good quality hair. There was just the normal hair you get in a beauty supply yeah, store. So yeah. there wasn't any virgin hair. Mm -hmm. So I said, let me go with this. And there was need because w with things like wigs, women can now wear wigs because they have receding hairline. Right. And then... So wigs is not just because of wigs. There's even a reason why no, you need that. No, there's ladies who don't completely, maybe from breastfeeding or other skin-related diseases... Right completely have no hair Age, line. you know, you start Age, having yeah, your hair. because I have many old clients. Right. They need wigs because mm -hmm. they're not confident enough to work without them. Okay. So, yeah. All right, let's talk, take a look at, uh, you know, the business angle of it. Uh, at what point did you start making profits and how patient or impatient were you, uh, you know, in making profits when now you started uh, Miss Carey Fashions? Um, I think with Miss Carey it was, in the beginning, I was just trying to make some money, just trying to get some pocket money and some airtime money and time, you know, <laughs> buy more dresses. Right. But then it got to a point where I realized I have, for me to look at a long picture, I have to build a brand. Mm -hmm. So it was never about the profits. It was more of building a brand, building mm -hmm. Miss Carey fashion. So right. I've put in so much into building the brand where it's beyond looking at the profits. You're going to a point where when, you build, when the brand becomes, gets the level it wants to be, then the profits come automatically. automatically. And I feel like we're not yet there, but we're getting there. All right. Yeah. What can you say has been your biggest challenge, Jordana? Um, I would say the biggest challenge, and this is not only for me, mm -hmm. but from people for people who have an idea that they want to implement mm -hmm. is actually um, the process of going from a concept to actually implementing your business idea. Right, right. Um, there's fear involved, there's also uncertainty and I think um, as a young business owner and as someone who has an idea it's very important to believe in yourself and believe in your idea. So I think that's one of the things that um, I've faced which is you know you have an idea sometimes and you have even an idea to grow your business mm -hmm. as is and mm -hmm. uh, where I stand right now but the question is are you believing in yourself enough to actually implement this All and right. once you get through that um, as I'm learning uh, it's something that um, leads you to greater heights All right. in business. Many people, Angie, uh, especially young people, like she says, you know, you have the idea, you know, you've been thinking about this thing for such a long time, and you can see that it's, you know, it has great potential. But well, one drawback, especially for young people, um, is capital. You know, they don't know, okay, so I have this idea, you know, where do I take it? Who am I going to, you know, go and ask for some, for some money? Her mom gave her 5,000, and she's like, I want my money back by Monday. Um, so how were you able to overcome that, you know, the, you know the difficulty of finding capital it's easy for me basically I saved any money I make from my business goes back to my business mm -hmm. you don't need thousands millions to start a business whatever little money you have invest it back that's that's what works for me mm -hmm. to a point where now I was able to easily finance things mm -hmm. and it's okay to start small I mean she started with 3,000 shillings right I mean look at her now what is 3,000 shillings that 3,000 will go to 6,000 12 next thing it's gone to a million all right and yeah okay is it the same thing for you uh, Yvonne yeah saving what well, if you really can't save because you have too little you know if you start saving like five sock you know per well, month it's gonna take you so much time mm -hmm. Um, to be honest, for me it was a bit of saving and also a bit of like trying to diversify your business or your, or your idea, you know, because some, so many people have an idea, mm -hmm. but sometimes if you look at the same thing about the bigger picture, there's so many ways around it. 
money is just a one factor, you know. Right. And sometimes you do, you can have, you might have the resources, you don't have the, the time, you know. But with me, I tried to take advantage of not just the money factor, it was just resources. If I ca came here and I see Betty, after this, I'm going to be giving Betty a dress. Yes. You know, like she's going <laughs> to be, you know, dressed in Miss Kelly next Friday right, briefing. So right, right, right. That costs nothing. It okay. costs, it's, you know, it's ambition, I guess, or just... Ambition. Yeah. Jordana, how would you say, um, you know, how have you gone around your marketing? Because, like, I mean, after you've gotten your idea, you've saved money and you have this business already. How can you sell it out? If you're a young person out there and you have a business, you know, how do you sell then the idea to other people? Like for her, she says, you know, I'm going to approach you and I'm going to sell, you know, a dress. For you, you know, how, what advice can you give when it comes to marketing? Uh, well, the most uh, important thing right now, I think even in the digital age is social media and uh, a lot of young business owners are gravitating more towards the social environment, especially the internet, mm -hmm. your website, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat mm -hmm. of recent times. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're a business and you actually want to um, survive, I say survive Survives. because mm -hmm. um, you cannot have a business without marketing. Mm -hmm. It's just that important. So you need to get updated on some of these um, platforms and just reach out to people. I think also social engagement. Uh, if, you, if you've been on Instagram, you'll notice that a lot of people like communicating. Mm. And I found that the more I communicate with my customers, the more I understand not only what they want, but then I'm able to just give them back that much more. All right. Yeah. So as we wind up, Angie, what is the one thing that you know, you'd want to achieve uh, in your business? Uh, you started small, but right now, what is it that, what's the kind of trajectory you're looking at when it comes to your business? Mostly expansion, because I'd like to cover the whole East African region, mm -hmm. start with the East African region. I still have clients mm -hmm. abroad, but I use DHL. Mm -hmm. But if I can expand to Rwanda, Uganda, have like legit stores, that's basically my That's plan. what you want to do. Yeah. All right, so it's time now to read the news. You guys are so serious. So let's see if you can do this. And so I have to choose. I have to choose. Um, Isaac, I'm going to ask my STO here in studio. Isaac, who, who, who should read the intro? Who should be the guest anchor among the three? The one next to me? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yvonne, um, it's your turn. Come on. It's easy. I'll All show right. you how. Don't worry. This is, this is easier than selling clothes. <laughs> well, you have to convince somebody. All right. So have a seat there. I think you'll do really well, so just relax. Breathe in. I didn't practice for this. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Let's actually see if you can actually nail it and be the next anchor. All right, so you can see clearly? Yeah. All right, fine. So introduce yourself and just take it slow. Take it slow. Okay. Should I go? Yes. Um, welcome to KTN Friday Briefing. I'm Yvonne Kere. Um, the week after KTN News revealed a major health insurance scam at the Bungoma County Assembly, officers from the Insurance Fraud Investigation Unit stormed the assembly and arrested four officials linked to the scandal. Robert Wanyoni reports. As the police continue the investigations into the health insurance scam at the Bungoma County Assembly, four officers at the assembly were made guests of the state today. Last year, we put an advert in the newspapers, I think that was around May, that we wanted a service provider for the medical insurance of, uh, for members of the county assembly and the staff. And uh, it was an open tender, which was duly processed. The assembly's finance officer, Eric Nabiranda Wasilwa, the procurement officer, Julian Aliaka Lunani, and two directors of Marco Insurance Company, Saidi Wangara Mohamed and Collins Bikeri, an insurance brokerage firm mentioned in the scandal, were arrested at a rent before Bungoma senior resident magistrate, Charles Mutai. 10th of March, number 2, 2 the suspects were accused that on diverse dates before the 23rd of January this year at the Bungoma County Assembly and with others not before the court, they conspired to defraud Jubilee Insurance Company a sum of Kenya shillings 7,779,750 being medical insurance premium payment for the staff and members of the County Assembly of Bungoma. 
For the third week running now, the Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission continues training its guns in Bungoma County. But the question the residents are asking is, are these the main culprits behind the various financial scams? Robert Wanyonyi, KTN News. All right. Thanks, Robert. So, Yvonne, you actually did really well. Oh, thank you. I'm even surprised she was nervous. So I'm going to give you a... I'm going to give you a 8 out of 10. That's what that'll do. That's good enough. You, oh, 7. I'm being told 7. <laughs> Someone has reduced my 1 point. 9. <laughs> oh, no. You want a 9? Mm. Don't worry. People have scored 0. So you're, you're good. Uh -huh, thank you. All right. So we want to take a break. Please tell us, you know, how she... How do you think you did? Um... I think it was good. It yeah. was good? Yeah, yeah. Angie, how did you? great. She did great. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> empowerment. Yeah. Feel empowerment. Yeah. All right, so what do we do next? Okay, the business news is coming up shortly. We'll go on a short break. Oh, all right. I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that was really good. Mm. Thank you. Yeah? Oh. Yeah? So did you enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> also towards some of the major projects in Mombasa, linking Moi International Airport and the Kenya Ports Authority. From May this year, this area will be very accessible. You know, passengers flying out to, to the airport, uh, they will get their flights on time. You know, uh, passengers coming out, whether tourists or locals, they will have a lot of uh, easy access uh, to the city and the port of Mombasa. The maritime sector plays a key role in the flooding of the cargo at the port of Mombasa before connecting to major roads in the country and the rest of the East African region. Francis Mtalaki, KT News, Mombasa. Now Kenya is the fifth country in Africa to be granted Category 1 status and clearance to fly directly to the United States. But Kenyan airlines like uh, Kenya Airways will need to apply for approval to cut share with U.S. airlines while concurrently pursuing approval for direct flights before the airline can fly directly to the United States. The best, however, for now could be partnerships. Well, we have more on that story. We anticipate that uh, maybe the next uh, possibly six weeks that will be possible. A statement by Kenya Airways dated Friday 24th February 2017 welcomed the approval by the U.S. Federal Aviation Administration to grant Kenya Category 1 status, adding that its first priority going forward is to pursue code share arrangements with our partners in the SkyTeam Alliance. This will enable us to sell tickets to and from any U.S. state and drive revenues directly to the U.S., and that while this process will take time, the airline will start on the process immediately. The sentiment in the statement that this is going to take some time for local airlines to fly directly to the United States was highlighted a few weeks ago by KQ management in a media briefing. The temptation from a PR and a political point of view to have KQ land in New York will be very strong. Um, but we need to be business orientated about it. The most important thing for us as an airline is that we will be able to code share with our American carriers, our partners there, so we can actually put, as Michael said, sell ticket stock, sell you a ticket from Nairobi through New York to uh, Atlanta or somewhere. That's the first most important thing. However, it is no doubt that this news has got business players in various sectors carried away on the vast investment window that could open up with direct flights to and from the United States. You recall in the year 2009, Delta Airlines wanted to fly to Nairobi from Atlanta, but it wasn't possible. Now that would be possible. We shall have Kenyans uh, flying to the U.S. directly. Uh, we shall have business people um, transporting uh, cargo, especially flowers, you know, textile uh, sort of products from Nairobi all the way to the U.S. So we, we anticipate either Atlanta, New York, uh, or Washington. While the jitters remain strong as to whether or not President Trump's protectionist administrative style will be open to trade with African nations, the clearance by FAA is a platform the private sector from both countries can use to bolster business to business and business to trade relations. Joy Dorin Bira, KTN News. Now, just how do elections affect tourism? Is there any cyclical impact every five years? Well, that's what our reporters sought to find out in the following report from Mombasa. Take a look. 
It's early 2017 and the electioneering mood has already set in. The voter registration and the elections that follow are part of a five-year cycle that often causes a major headache for many investors alike. The economy softens as major players adopt a wait-and-see attitude. While visitor numbers drops due to postponed trip or simply a different choice of destination for tourists, in the hospitality sector, it is often a period that hits them hard. Of course, you always have this state of apprehension of what will happen, which seems to be a cyclical event. Now, with the apparatus in place, what I would recommend is that the rhetoric is toned down because this country has a fantastic future. Our investors have put in a lot of money in this uh, establishment and they have not just done this out of the blue, they did their research, which then means the business confidence in Kenya is rising. Over the past few years, security at the Kenyan coast has stabilized to a degree. Stakeholders hope that going forward, this trend is maintained and that during the electioneering period, their security and the security of their guests and property is guaranteed. They have a proposal to security apparatus. We probably need to look at giving priority to tourism so that um, we have a bigger budget and we are able to uh, market better our destination. Part of the struggle for sector is to counter the growing allure of competitor destinations across Africa during this period. The election fever of 2007 that resulted in post-poll chaos across the country remain a past many in the industry will want to forget the instability that ultimately saw thousands of employees sent home. Francis Ontomwa, KTN News, Mombasa. Now, as the result season continues, British American Tobacco announced a 4.2 billion shillings after profits in the full year and at 31st of December 2016, giving their shareholders a 43 shilling dividend per share. All these and more in our corporate brief. And just look at the uh... British American Tobacco Kenya announced its full year results for the year and at 31st December of 2016, posting an after tax profit of 4.2 billion shillings on the back of gross revenues of 36.7 billion. The company paid taxes topping 19.2 billion shillings, marking a record breaking contribution to government revenue. The company's shareholders are set to receive a total dividend of 43 shillings per share. 2017, um, we've got good share momentum in the domestic market, so we would, uh, we would anticipate uh, increasing uh, our market share. Meanwhile, Stan Big Bank has reported a decline in pre-tax profit to 6.05 billion shillings, down from 7.36 billion shillings. Total income rose to 18.52 billion shillings from 16.94 billion shillings a year before, while net interest income rose to 10.86 billion shillings from 9.30 billion shillings. And lastly, Kenya Power has recorded an 11.6% net profit growth to 4.2 billion shillings in the half year ended December, helped by higher electricity sales. The company sold electricity worth 45.7 billion shillings in the review period, up 9.9%. Ashley Mazuri, KTN News. All right, so let's now take a look at sporting action. Government, the government has pledged 2.7 billion shillings that will be used to upgrade infrastructure as Kenya prepares to host the Chan Championships in 2018. The Confederation of African Football, uh, CAF, has also assured Kenya that it will host the Africa Cup of Nations. Uh, Chan dispelling uh, rumors that the tournament was to be moved to another country. After five days inspecting the five stadiums that will be used for the Africa Nations Championship that raised uncertainty among football lovers in the country due to a number of facilities failing to meet the set standards, officials from the Confederation of African Football led by Vice President Suketu Patel gave Football Kenya Federation and Kenyans an assurance that the tournament meant for the local best players in Africa will take place in Kenya. The assurance moved to dispel rumors that the tournament could be moved to a more developed country. The only country that is in uh, CAF's mind as to who will host Shan next year is Kenya. And it's really up to Kenya to deliver what we expect from a tournament of this nature. And uh, I would like to, to end that speculation at, at, uh, 
at all costs, so that it allows Kenya itself to, to concentrate on the job at hand. After meeting with the CAF officials and FKF, the government pledged 2.7 billion shillings aimed towards preparations for the tournament. Let me assure you that the Kenyan government has committed 2.7 billion shillings to, to Cham. Um, out of that, 200 million has been earmarked for the LOC, which is the local organizing committee, whose first meeting will be next week. On the government also revealed that it's in talks with county governments to ensure the stadiums are upgraded into the set standards. In, in some of the uh, uh, counties, we already have an MOU. Uh, in places where we, we may not have that MOU, we will develop one. not late at all. We just need to work. If they come back here and we haven't done what we're supposed to have done in June, they're coming back in June now, then, then we, we'll have problems. The stadiums that were inspected include Nyayo and Moy Sports Center Akasarani in Nairobi, Kipchoge Keino in Eldoret, Kinoru in Meru and Kenyatta Stadium in Machakos. CAF is expected to give a report after 10 days, which will assist Kenya to speed up preparation towards the Bayano Shoppies that last took place in Rwanda. Robinson Okenyi, KTN Sports. The Roll Ball national teams believe that the good results they posted at the just concluded World Cup will help promote the sport in the country. The team arrived in the country on Friday from Bangladesh, where they won bronze. After a wonderful performance in the just concluded World Cup in Bangladesh, where they won bronze, the men and women's rollball national team jetted back into the country on Friday afternoon. They were beaten by the Indian who went to clinch the trophy. And I say thank you because the matches were so tough. Out of 39 teams all over the world, we try our best. The male team thrashed host Bangladesh 7-1 in the third playoff, while their female counterparts, who went into the tournament as defending champions, hammered Senegal 8-1 after a 3-2 defeat in the semi-final against a well-equipped Iran. I would say we had high expectations as we went there. We knew that we would be the best, so I think even our ego played a part. Though we aimed for the stars, we are now on the, on the clouds, so we know next time we are aiming much higher. We're going to work on what we have learned from there. The two teams will now take a three-month break before resuming training in June ahead of the East Africa Championships slated for August in Tanzania. The affecting will come through the preparation because to train indoor, it, it was the first thing which affected us because we just get only two days to train indoor. Till the last moment, the last time, we never knew that we would go there because I remember that I spent a night here at the JKIA before traveling. And that was really hard for me. Despite the challenges the team faced before traveling to Bangladesh for the fourth edition of the World Cup, they managed to finish third in the tournament. Abula Ahmed, KT Sports, at the Jomo Kenyatta International Airport, Nairobi. Jose Mourinho's uh, Manchester United have been withdrawn against Russia's side FC Rostov in the Europa League last 16. United, considered the favourites by many bookmakers, are the only British side left in Europe's secondary club competition after Tottenham Hotspurs were knocked out of the contention by Gent uh, Mourinho's side on aggregate in the last 32. The two legged legged uh, ties will be played on Thursday, 9th March, and Thursday. Uh, 16th March. All right, so we want to wind up Friday briefing tonight. Ladies, did you have a good time? Yeah, we did. Mm -hmm. All right, so okay, so before we, I get the last set of minutes, we had a big question, and uh, tonight we were asking you if you think uh, the CS for health clear of Mailu and his peers, Nicolas Moraguri, should vacate office now that it uh, is apparent that they are impediments to negotiations, uh, of course, to end the doctor's strike. That has been a big question, and as you can see, you polled and 11 percent uh, say no and uh, 89 percent say yes thank you so much for all your comments and your feedback on it all right so ladies before we wind up people out there who are aspiring i'm seeing very many people on twitter and instagram cheering you on um what is the one thing that you would tell somebody who's starting thinking of starting business uh, start with you jordana uh, the one thing i would 
one thing I would say is that believe in yourself mm -hmm. and believe in your ideas. It's possible. Anybody who got to where they are now got there because they believed in themselves. Okay. Yeah. All right, Angie. Simple. Sky is the limit, and always put God first in everything you do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say be passionate about what you do, or do what you're passionate about. So it's all about passion. Passion, yeah. All right. Thank you so much, ladies. It's been a great time here on st in studio having you. You had Thank fun. You. <laughs> yeah, you had fun. Yeah, for having us. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. So if you want to have any of their lovely stuff, uh, luxury hair by Angie on Instagram is the what you should uh, look out for. Uh, we also have Plashik. You're also on Instagram. Yeah. And uh, of course, Miss Carrie, you know Miss Carrie on Facebook and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. So follow them and see what they have to offer and support women, you know, support women. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right. So we've come to the end of Friday Briefing. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for all your contributions on my Twitter page, Instagram, everywhere, everywhere. We thank you so much. So have a great weekend. Don't do crazy bad things. Be safe. Don't drink and drive. And uh, what, what other advice can you give somebody? Be safe. Be safe, yeah. Be and enjoy the weekend. And enjoy the yes. weekend. Monday's coming up. Monday's <laughs> coming in two days. All right, so yeah. be safe, guys. And uh, I'm Betty Keller. We'll see you again next Friday. This has been Yvonne Kere, Jordana Washera, and Angie Ilibu. All right, goodbye. See you soon. <laughs> All right, that was good. Yeah.